last night, a wintry mix fell upon Austin, Texas. If you're anything like me, most likely this morning you woke up and you scurried to your window and you pulled the blinds down to see if the snow is on the ground. Oh, it's on top of the cars. And then you do, if you're from Texas, one really important thing after this. You scurry over to your laptop, you open it up, and you look to see if school's closed for the day. I'm a grown adult, but I was still like, school day feels really cool, especially when we're in Texas, you know what I mean? Because we liked imagining school days because you imagine it's going to be some kind of a snow apocalypse and you're going to have to survive it. And all of a sudden your mom's like, put the bath, turn on the bathtub, get the water, fill it up, the pipes might freeze, make sure we got the canned food. You figure out which of your sweaters you're going to use to put on for warmth and which ones you can like rip up and tie around a broken broom handle and dip in kerosene for a torch. You know? There's like this emergency mindset that we get into. Sometimes I feel that when I'm just at home, like not wanting to go get food somewhere and there's no food left in my house. And so, you know, you like go to the pantry and it's like, oh, you know, there's uh, some tortillas, and I got some uh, spaghetti. Some, uh, have you ever made a spaghetti taco? I just got back yesterday from a trip, and all we had was chili, and I made a chili taco. Listen to me. You can make a taco out of anything. You just need a tortilla. You know, there's this practice of going into the pantry... And, 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 and saying to myself, okay, I can't go out and discover food anywhere else. I'm going to have to make do with what I got. I'm going to have to recover what I've already got right in here, right now. Have you ever been making a PowerPoint presentation? And it's one hour before your presentation. And you're on Unsplash looking at stock photography. And you're like, what the hell is going to say synergy for me? <laughs> and then all of the sudden, your past self walks into the room, the ghost of your past self, and whispers into your ear, that consumer beverage company you did a workshop for in 2016. Three slides will work here. You're welcome. And then you think to yourself, oh, yes, I've been here before. I don't have to go out and discover something else that I have to put in my playbook. I need to recover things that I've had. These are the stories that we love. These are the stories that we pay attention to. There's this one about a prince. His father gets murdered by his uncle. He's got to flee, and so he takes up with some vagabonds, and they live off the land. His sweetheart comes to find him years later to say, the kingdom is in disarray. Only you can come back and save us. But he doubts it. He says, I don't have what it takes. I, I think I'm going to have to go discover some new knowledge and skills. But I'm talking about Simba, right? And this is the Lion King. Are you, I'm going to have to go out Nala and find. And she says, no, it's about recovering who you've always been. Isn't this what we do for our clients. We don't go into a room with our, armed with our answers. We go into our room if we're really going to serve our clients, believing that the answers to their greatest challenges are already locked in that room, and it is our job to bring them out. It is not our job to discover. It is our job to recover. So this is really great for us to do for our clients but man, this is really hard to do for ourselves. This, you know, this, this is why the cobbler's kids have holes in their shoes, you know? This is why management consultants are terrible entrepreneurs. This is why the dermatologist kids have back zits. This is why the urologists, I'll stop there. <laughs> what do we do before we go into the room? The success of any intervention depends upon the interior condition of the intervener. We've got the knowledge and skills and spades. 
We have access to all kinds of things that we can bring with us, but are we willing to do the work prior to make sure that when we come into that room, we're ready to help those folks recover what it is that they need to recover? I like to start with gratitude. Some folks, when we begin a session, you know, we want to get people talking. And, you know, if there's trust in the room, it's great to get folks to have an intimate conversation. Uh, But sometimes that doesn't always work and people are a little rebuffed by that. I often find that talking about things we're grateful for is a great way to start. Because all of a sudden... We're not worried about what we're going to have to do. We, our brains get wiped. There's a clean slate. As Solomon says, our amygdala relaxes, and people become available for something. So let's just try this real quick. Think about something that's going well in your life. Think about something that's going right. This is just how we do it in a session. And just turn in 30 seconds and share it to your neighbor. Like, this is one ray of sunshine in my life right now. Go. Thank you. Let me hear two things and and brag on your partner. What do we hear? What did you hear your partner say that you said? Oh, that's good. Yes. My sweet young son. My sweet young son. When he's asleep. (laughs) We keep lots of NyQuil around. What else? One more. We've got a freelancer who's killing it. Went out on her own and is making it rain. Congratulations. Give a round of applause. Yes. But here's the thing about getting folks to this place. You can feel the temperature in the room change whenever we talk about things that we're grateful for. But I can't give a gift like that to a room if I don't have that gift myself. I was a magician growing up. And I was good. And I would do birthday parties. And I would make balls disappear and handkerchiefs disappear. But every time I would master a new trick, there was this problem. I stopped being impressed with the trick that I was performing. And so I would move from trick to trick, no longer enjoying it because the knowledge and the skill didn't seem complicated to me anymore. So seeking wisdom, I went to the local magic shop where there was this wise old magician who would proffer advice to young people and he would sit in the corner and I walked in and I said, master, uh, can, what am I supposed to do? No, my magic tricks are no longer uh, impressive to me. He said, oh, it's a sad day in a young magician's life when he's no longer impressed with his own magic. But he stands up and he walks over, puts his hands on the counter, and he says, learning how to do the illusion is only step one of being a magician. Knowing how to return to the wonder you felt when you first saw the trick performed. Now this is the magic. And then he snapped his fingers and he turned into a raven and he flew (laughs) out the... (laughs) If I don't believe that I have a gift, how am I going to give a gift? We're freelancing right now. Was there a job that you left to freelance? Was freelancing a thing that you've wanted to do? Uh, Okay, that didn't work. (laughs) That didn't work. What does it look like for us before we begin our work to make sure that we think, I'm choosing to be here. One year, two years, three years, or four years ago, I wouldn't have believed that I had the chance to do this. And if we can remember that we have this privilege of walking into a room to guide folks, perhaps then we can give this gift of gratitude back to them. My grandmother, she would paint her fingernails methodically. She had the bottles across her bathroom and she would pull one down and the red would coat her fingernail. You could see the bristles so slowly. I would say to her, Nana, why is it that you paint your fingernails so slowly? And she would blow on them and say, honey, it's because I paint my fingernails like this that you're alive. I would say, Nana, what do you mean? And she said, honey, If I take this good care of my fingernails, don't you think I made sure your dad didn't kill himself? (laughs) She had a tidy house. She had painted fingernails. Her car was always clean and her her clothes were folded. 
The way that she did anything was the way that she did everything. As facilitators, what mindsets do we carry about the people whom we're about to go interact with? When we're doing discovery interviews, do you ever have someone who works for the organization you're going to serve say, now watch out for Sarah, watch out for Jonathan, they're gonna be a naysayer. And then don't we carry this story into the room with us if we're not careful? Those thoughts that we carry, the way that we behave, the postures we take, this permeates into the rest of our experience. How do we make sure as we approach any engagement that we consider where our mind is at, where our spirit is at, where are we worried, where are we anxious, and where are we frustrated? Because this, my friends, echoes into the rest of our actions. I had a mentor, and his name was Earl. I was in college, and I couldn't get a girlfriend, so I was involved. Student Association for Campus Activities, student government, student organization. I was busy. I was building a resume. I was going to go make something of myself, but I was applying for all these jobs, and I wasn't getting them, and I was frustrated, so I would walk into Earl's office, and I would sit down, and I would complain about my station in life, and Earl was patient, and he would sit in his chair and it would swivel. And he would let me finish and finally the swivel would stop. And he would look at me and with kindness say the same thing that he said every single time. Reagan, this is gonna make a lot more sense for you when you realize that it's not about you. Earl died a few years later and 1,000 people went to his funeral. Earl possessed knowledge and skills, but it was not Earl's knowledge and skills that allowed him to have a lasting impact on me and those who he served. It is easy for us before we take on an engagement to walk into the room believing that we are being held up and judged the entire time. It's easy for us to believe that our career is dependent upon doing perfect in this interaction or that us achieving the result that we told them that we would achieve is going to determine whether or not we are going to ever be successful in this field. But let me tell you something. It's not about you. And here's the paradoxical beauty of realizing that it's not about us. The second we can believe and remember that it's not about us walking into the room to do this work, the stakes that we once believed to be so high, they can vanish. And the second we don't believe the stakes exist anymore about whether or not we have value, the second that we are able to recover those pieces of ourselves that can really connect and be with the people in the room. People, I don't know if you know this, we don't like to have things done to us. But we do enjoy it whenever folks decide to show up to a room and be with us the way that we need to be been with. This all happens before we walk into the room. This all happens before we speak to one person. My friends, this is the inner work of the facilitator. Thank you.